Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen here with Life Coach Cindy Chavez. Today is Wednesday, October the 16th, 2019. Happy Neville Day, everybody. It's 4 p.m. New York time and 1 p.m. Los Angeles time. That's 9 p.m. London, 5 a.m. in Tokyo, 6 a.m. in Sydney, Australia. Wherever you are in the world, thank you for joining us for another episode of LOA Today, your daily dose of happy. And I'm happy that Cindy's back and we're back to talking Neville stuff again. I, I mean... Two weeks of withdrawal is really rough. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> it's all in your imagination. <laughs> I know. It, that's the worst part. I'm imagining this stuff. It's like, oh, wait a minute. No, I'm the one who, oh, no, it's me. Oh, no, no. <laughs> right? Right. Oh, my goodness. Well, it's good to be back and uh, good to be ready for some more Neville. And we figured out before we got started that we didn't actually finish Chapter 8 last time. So we're going to cut into the middle of that. And uh, it took us a little bit to figure out, okay, where were we? Which story have we read? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's so crazy. Like, I, when you announce the, the date, you know, it's like Wednesday, October 16th. Yeah. And where did it go? Where, <laughs> right. Where did it go? And I know a client was speaking with me about this, and we, we agreed that every year we say the same thing. You know, it starts getting close to the end of the year, and we're like, oh, my goodness, where did the year go? And every year, it seems like it goes by a little bit faster, mm -hmm. especially as compared to when we were kids. Oh, yeah. Or if it was Monday and something great was happening on Friday, it, just, it took forever for it to get here. So I'm working on, you know, doing some time collapsing here. It's like, you know, oh. right? Like we, we can have time go at the speed we need it to go, I think. And so I do. I do think that. Yes, I yeah. agree with you. I and, think Neville and, would agree with that, right? Oh, yes. I'm, I'm sure he would. It's a, and once again, it's a skill that you have to learn. You have to learn to basically get a grip, get a hold of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> there's a really, there's a really fantastic book that you may have read. It's called The Big Leap by Gay no, Hendricks. Hmm. And in that book, mostly what he talks about is, uh, um, now I can't think of the, the word that we use, up, upper limits. Right, like when we, like when we're younger, we we decide what we think is normal. Yes, right. <laughs> and like for instance, if you were raised in a family that made a certain amount of money, then mm -hmm. that might seem okay, and maybe a little more than that's okay. But sometimes we get too far past that, and it's we have an upper limit. So he talks about that in most of the book, but in part of the book, he talks about kind of like time manipulation. And mm -hmm. one of the things that he talks about is not rushing yes like never hurrying and he was talking about how different incidents where it would be really easy to hurry like you're late for work and you're you know try, and how when he remembers not to that everything works out like it's like he's had times where he should have been late and wasn't late and can't mm -hmm. figure out why but he just decided and so i remember putting that into practice for a little while you know, years ago when I first read it. And I'm thinking about that lately. It's like, I'm going to remember that again. It's like, so we have all the time we need. Because those are the two excuses that you hear the most. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. Yes, that's true. Right? It also occurs to me, too, that probably, now I, I can't say I can definitively draw these two points together, but they, they, they seem to go together in my mind. Probably when we are stressed out by stuff, or when we allow stuff to stress ourselves out, that's probably when we lose track, when, when, when right. the, the rush happens. If you notice, during times when you feel rushed, and like you said, stressed and rushed, um, most of that sort of like rushing around is internal. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? Even when we're not physically rushing around, we can have that sense of like urgency and sense of having to rush around and stress. And I remember working on a project one time this year where I had a deadline and I had to get it done and I had waited a little bit longer than I wish I would have waited and I was really crushed for time and it, I recognized it was really causing me to feel, I was feeling stressed out about it. Oh my gosh, how am I going to get all this done in this little amount of time? And I remembered all of this and I just decided to calm my inner self down to like, and I said, I kept saying to myself, I'm going to do this in a relaxed way and it's going to get done and it'll be fine. And it was. Yes. <laughs> so, so yeah, we can do that. 
that's a, a good thing to remember. It also occurs to me that one of the purposes of meditation is to slow us down. Slow us to, down, right? To slow, no, to basically reduce the world down to breathing full breaths and just focusing on one thing and relaxing the yep. mind and all that. And that inevitably is going to seem to slow time down just because we're focusing on this very I easy thing. I tell you, about 10 years ago, I had a really, I don't, I do not have the same practice now, but at the time I was meditating for an hour a day and it seemed ridiculous at first that I would be able to fit that in, but it seemed like I had more time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. it expanded my sense of time because I wasn't rushing around trying to fit everything else in and I'm still doing that every day. And it was like, huh, what happened here? It's like, time yeah, right. Expanded. Yeah. It, well, it's interesting because I've been kind of experimenting with this over the last few days. Um, the breathing thing particularly came to my mind today as I was driving around doing some errands for the, the gardening business. And I was realizing that one of the main purposes of meditation is to focus on doing a lot of full breathing because we do yes. tend to breathe in a shallow way. Yep. very often throughout our lives. So I, w I decided, well, I was going to take advantage of that while I was driving, just do some full breathing while I'm driving. I mean, I, I can pay attention to the road and breathe at the same time. I've done that for years. So right. <laughs> <a> difficult thing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as I was doing that, I was immediately feeling more relaxed, which in traffic is always a good thing to do, to feel relaxed. And when I was done, I came home home or actually to the office, which is the same thing, and had uh, an issue going on that had been, it was part of like two or three issues that had all been tying together. And one of them had had a really interesting law of attraction ending to it. I told the story a couple of days ago, but this is more stuff tied into it. And it was more opportunity to feel stressed, more opportunity oh. to get really upset about things that weren't working out that should have been working out, but they weren't working out. But I just finished this breathing thing while I was driving. And, and when I got back here, I started to make the contact I had to make that I'd been kind of dreading and, you know, try to get the thing ironed out and talk about things falling into place. The, the whole thing started off as a complete mess. And within like an hour, everything had just kind of fallen into place <laughs> on its own. And I thought, wow, that was the breathing part of that. It must have been. But it was just amazing how it just kind of just settled in. It, it was like the, it was literally the story of chaos falling into order within an hour's time. Yeah. It, it reminds me of, you know, I do this product every month for the new moon cycle. Right. Yeah. And one of the things in the product every month is a meditation. Uh -huh. And one of the things that I always say in a meditation, once it gets to the point where I know the listener is deeply relaxed, is as you relax events and circumstances in your life are relaxing as well. Ah. And I think it's really true. I mean, it, mm. it happens just like you just said. Yeah. It's amazing. It is amazing. Because we're energy and the energy connected to us follows the energy. And that's amazing. I love that story. I've also been, in the last week or so, really focused on the idea of us as energy, literally a source energy, as Abraham terms it. And how, how I am choosing to visualize that or to feel it in me, in my physical body. Because I've been asking myself, okay, so what is it like to be the spiritual part of me in this body? What does that feel like? You know, we, we just tend to think of ourselves as our bodies. But I have this, this image that's going on in my head. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like a light bulb that's on. When a light bulb is on, the light is continuous. It just keeps flowing and flowing and flowing. Now, it has its wavelengths and so forth, but we don't see that. All we just see is this continuity of light. Yeah. And that's what I've been visualizing in, inside my body. Inside my, my physical skeletal structure, you know, inside all the tissues, there is this beam of light that is just constantly glowing. That's the way I've been thinking about it. Oh, basically. I love this. And as I've been thinking about that, I've been asking myself, okay, well, does it feel continuous throughout my body? And I realized, no, there are certain times, certain places where it doesn't feel, there's like a discontinuity. And I'm realizing those are often places where I feel discomfort or I feel like there's an issue going on or whatever. I now have a way that I didn't have before to truly imagine and visualize what the difference is between health and disease. And I, I think love it. 
It's like oh. an energy block where there's yeah, see, yeah, exactly, exactly, and and it's tangible. You know, it's it's no longer just theoretical. I can actually <laughs> feel it, and That's I'm thinking, cool. wow, this is really great. You know, so. Yeah. I don't know where this model is going to go, but I like the start. <laughs> I like it too. I'm glad you shared it. I love the the image of mm-hmm. the glowing light inside the container, so to speak. Then it right. shines out, you know. And if you if you think about it, every single belief system, every religion, every all, going all the way back has often associated the life in the body with light. Right. Right. We hear when someone's when the light has gone out of their eyes, right? Yep. Their health is dim. Um, it's, it's always been seen that way across all different, you know, places and mm-hmm. belief systems. And, and I love that idea because, like you said, it's it gives you something that's almost tangible. Like you can feel it in your body. You can scan your body and recognize where there may be leaks or blocks. And, well, that's the advantage also of the Abraham approach, because Abraham teaches us that a belief is a thought you think over and over again. So if you keep focusing on this concept, which I've been doing, you do start to feel it. <laughs> I, I have gotten to the point now where I can feel this this light beam. It's not even a beam. It's a it's a glow, I guess. It, it's, it's a continuity. That's the best word I have. It's a continuity inside me, and I can feel it now. I'm thinking, whoa, this is great. I'm actually creating this this image. Next week, I'm probably going to have to show up with sunglasses on. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, we're glowing brightly here. (laughs) (laughs) Well, do we have announcements before we dive into Neville? We do indeed, and we want to make sure we touch on those before we do our Neville. So the announcements are very simple. They come down to one thing. Are you subscribing to the podcast? Because if you're not, we want to encourage you to do exactly that. And it's so simple these days because we're on virtually every pop platform that's out there that does podcasting. Um, so whether you are an iPhone user and use the uh, uh, the podcast software that's built in there or Google Play, Google Podcasts, actually, or on an Android phone or any of the other platforms, Pandora, Spotify, you, know, I mean, you name it, we're on all of them. And if you can't find us on the one that you're using, well, just go to LOAToday.net's web, website homepage and you will find us right at the top with a little bit of a link there that says, here's where you subscribe. Just click here and it'll walk you right through the process. And then uh, also feel free to watch us on YouTube. You can subscribe to us on YouTube by doing a search for LOA Today podcast videos. Click the subscribe button and then click the little bell so you can be notified. And you, now you can see us as we're doing these because we live stream to YouTube while we are recording these shows. And uh, it kind of adds a nice element. Plus, we also get our live streamers. Right now, uh, we've got Jeffrey and uh, Nasha tuned in. And uh, and Jeffrey's saying, ooh, I would I would tune in for a meditation guided by Cindy. Actually, you have, Jeffrey, because we had Cindy do a couple <laughs> meditations. But we'll have to do that again sometime. do that one time, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, please do subscribe uh, uh, to the podcast and check us out on YouTube as well so you can see us. And if you are so inclined, we are doing the shows now at the same time every day, Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. New York time. If that's a time frame that's available for you, you know, drop in and, and uh, join us and interact with us like Jeffrey and Nasha and others do because we love to have that interaction. So those are our announcements for the day. Excellent. Yes, we did do a meditation one time. And I we remember did. that one of the people that was on live with us in the meditation in the chat afterwards said, um, I'm not sure if I fell asleep or what happened, but yeah. all of a sudden <laughs> it was over and I could <laughs> and I it, it it always uh, brings a smile to my face because we were talking about editing earlier, right. uh, editing and audio. And when I record the meditations, when I'm editing them, which I love the process, like I'm, I think I'm pretty good at it. So I, I, it's something that's fun for me is to, to do the editing. Sure. But occasionally I will be like, oops, because I'm listening and all of a sudden I'm so relaxed. I was like, uh oh, it's like, <laughs> I have to go back, start over. So yeah, that's kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's like the acid test. If you can put yourself into a trance, you know you do. <laughs> All right. Oh yeah. Well, you know the best hypnotists go into trance very easily. So um, hypnotism, meditation, all of that. Uh, I always say when people sometimes people get nervous about being hypnotized or about meditation, uh, they say, "Well, it's kind of scary. I've never meditated before, and I'm afraid that I'm going to go into a trance." And the truth is. Uh, all hypnotism is self-hypnotism, right? Mm. Uh, you always have control when you are meditating. You always can decide to come out 
if you want to use that word, come out of the trance. It's, it's usually not that deep anyway, but, um, from our, from our normal waking brainwave to the meditative, it's a big, it's a big shift. So mm-hmm. it feels mm-hmm. wonderful. It feels it wonderful does. to be deeply relaxed and we don't give that to ourselves often enough, I don't think. So I'm glad oh. to hear that you're, well, and you're, we'll have, to, we'll have to give it to ourselves again. That's all. Yes. We'll just have to schedule time to do that. We'll do it. We'll do it again. All right, so we are in Chapter 8 of Neville's book, The Law and the Promise. We almost finished it last week. We told, we read a couple of stories, and then we're going to start with the last story in this chapter, uh, another story that was probably written as a letter and sent in to Neville. Mm-hmm. Um, this was way before we could email each other. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> but he says, the following story proves that it's possible – for an individual to transfer the center of imagining to some greater or lesser degree to a distant area and not only do so without moving physically, but to be visible to others who are present at that point in space time. Which fits and, the title of the chapter, by the way, because I want to remind people the title of the chapter is Through the Looking Glass. And that's yes. exactly what this experience <laughs> is. It's a through the last looking glass experience. Seriously. He says, and if this be a dream, then... Is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream from Edgar (laughs) Allan Poe? And it's really a fantastic story. Uh, The woman writes, seated in my living room in San Francisco, I imagined I was in my daughter's living room in London, England. I surrounded myself so completely with that room, which I knew intimately, that I suddenly found myself actually standing in it. My daughter was standing by her fireplace Her face turned away from me. A moment later, she turned and our eyes met. I saw such a startled, frightened expression on her face that I, too, became emotionally upset and immediately found myself back in my own living room in San Francisco. Five days later, I received an airmail letter from my daughter, which had been written on the day of my experiment with imaginal travel. In her letter, she told me she had seen me in her living room that day, just as real as though I were actually standing there in the flesh. She confessed that she'd been frightened and that before she could speak, I had vanished. The time of this visitation, as she gave it in her letter, was exactly the time I had begun the imaginative action allowing, of course, for the difference in time between the two points. She explained that she told her husband of this amazing experience, and he insisted that she write to me immediately as he stated, your mother must have died or is dying. (laughs) But I wasn't dead or dying, but very much alive and very excited by this marvelous experience. Mm, Truly marvelous. That's quite a great story because you don't often hear the story where both sides are told. Because that's, that's, right, that's there's the recipient side and there's the the person experiencing it side. I mean, both of them telling the same story. That's such a good point because I could hear someone saying, "Boy, it was just like I was there." Right. But this is like her side and then the daughter writing, and it cracked me up that the husband. I mean, how many people? I might even have that, uh, right? That response. If oh, that you're that must I be that dying. The other side of the world suddenly appeared in my living room and then vanished. I might say, "Oh my gosh, I hope they're not dying." There, there are a lot of people who have that kind of story, so it, it kind of makes sense that you draw true. that conclusion. Yeah, that's you know. true. But it so, goes to prove that that these kinds of visitations don't necessarily have to be death related. They can be related to just things like experimenting with this thing or just you know having it happen. I think it's interesting that she made the comment that she knew this this home or this living room, that she yes. knew it intimately. So she was able to imagine all the little details. Um, a couple of the other stories that we've read previously, the person had imagined every little detail. I think I remember mm-hmm. someone talking about imagining um, photos on a table or something, right? Just every mm-hmm. little detail. So she, she was able to really um, make it real. Yeah, no kidding. In her imagination. Uh, Neville says, he, he uses this quote, nothing can act but where it is. With all my heart, only where is it? He says, man is all imagination. And I love this paragraph. It's, it's very intense. Man is all imagination. Therefore, a man must be where he is in imagination. For his imagination is himself. Imagination is active at and through any state that it is aware of. 
If we take shifting of awareness seriously, there are possibilities beyond belief. And, you know, I was thinking about how we experience everything, um, the whole, we laugh about this where we say it's all in our head. Mm-hmm. And we go, yeah, the thing is, we just don't know how big that space is in there, right? right. <laughs> it's like, it's, yep. and, and I think about the idea of, of sitting in a relaxed state with your eyes closed and imagining yourself to be somewhere else. And who says you're not there? <laughs> I mean, I can, we have a story right here of someone being seen in the other place. And mm-hmm. I think that's amazing. Like, I think it's all in our head. We're imagining it. So someone could potentially, I mean, and I've, I've actually, Neville has told this story before where he was in a meditative state. He was imagining himself somewhere and someone told him that they saw him, mm-hmm. right? Like, oh, I saw you in town, you know, in town the other day or whatever. So this is a really fun thing to play with, right? <laughs> it is. Well, it also, I mean, you asked the question, who's to say that you weren't actually there? And and the immediate answer that came to me was, well, you. You're the one who, because that's what we normally do. We normally say, oh, no, no, I, I just imagined that. I wasn't really there. So we're the ones who, who actually prevent it from happening more often than not. Right. Because we're, we're saying, no, I'm here in, in my office sitting in this chair. Exactly. You know, if if we, I think what happened here is, she found a way to kind of let go of that second part mm-hmm. and just not be concerned with, well, I can't be over in London, England. I've got to be here in San Francisco because I, I know that's where I am. She let go of that for, for some reason that she doesn't state in the story, but somehow she let go of that. Well, I think that when we allow imagination to be full, that's what happens. In the same way that when we have a dream, we often are you know, most of us have woken up from at least one dream where we thought it seemed so real Mm -hmm. True. that we had to look around like, wow, that was so real. Am I here? or Was I there? What happened? I think it's the same kind of thing. It's, it's all going on in that same part of our mind. You're probably right because if it's real enough to us, that's going to be enough to let go. And what you're describing is, is a very high level of, wow, this is real. Yeah. So Neville says the senses join man in forced and unholy wedlock (laughs) (laughs) to what, were he imaginatively awake, he would put asunder. And that's what you're saying right now. Yes, right. That is the, no, 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 I was in San Francisco. Um, We need not feed on sense data. Shift the focus of awareness and see what happens. However little we move mentally, we should perceive the world under a slightly changed aspect. Awareness is usually moved about in space by movement of the physical organism, but it need not be so restricted. It can be moved by a change in what we are aware of. Man is manifesting the power of imagination whose limits he cannot define. To realize that the real self, imagination, is not something enclosed within the spatial boundary of the body is most important. The foregoing, now, you know, I, I heard somebody say something recently, and I want to try to get it right the way they said it, but they were saying that we always think of, like you were talking about that part of you that's not your physical part. Right. And they, they, they made a comment that we always think of our, our spirit um, as being in our body, but actually it's the other way around. Our body is in our spirit. Mm. And... Uh, we're bigger than our body, I think, is the idea. Mm-hmm. And that sort of reminds me of what Neville's saying here, is that our real self is not something enclosed within the spatial boundary of our body. Right. Abraham talks about that in a different way. They describe our physical bodies as being extensions of our true selves. In other words, they aren't. it isn't the, the equivalent of our true self. It's more like the projection, our, our true, true self projecting into the physical world and manifesting as this physical body that that's the extension of ourselves. Yeah. Because we often think of this body as like a container. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and that's limiting. It is. I hadn't thought of it before, but okay. So Neville says the foregoing story proves that when we meet a person in the flesh, that his real self need not be present in space where his body is. It also shows that sense perception 
can be thrown into operation outside of the normal physical means and that the sense data produced is of the same kind as those which occur in normal perception. The idea in the mother's mind which started the whole process going was the very definite idea of being in the place where her daughter lived. And if the mother really were in that place, and if the daughter were present, then she would have to be perceptible to her daughter. We can only hope to understand this experience in imaginal and not in mechanical or materialistic terms. The mother imagined elsewhere as being here. London was just as here to her daughter living there as San Francisco was here to the mother living there. It hardly ever crosses our minds that this world might be different in essence from what common sense tells us is, it so obviously is. Blake writes, I question not my corporeal or vegetative eye any more than I would question a window concerning a sight. I look through it and not with it. This looking through the eye not only shifts consciousness to other parts of this world, but to other worlds as well. Astronomers must wish they knew more of this looking through the eye, this mental traveling that mystics practice so easily. <laughs> and then he quotes Blake, I traveled through a land of men, a land of men and women too, and heard and saw such dreadful things as cold earth wanderers never knew. <laughs> Mental traveling has been practiced by awakened men and women since the earliest days. Paul states, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Paul is telling us that he is that man and that he traveled by the power of imagination or Christ. Now, this is the time that we remind anyone listening that we take out the Neville decoder ring and we remember right. <laughs> that when Neville talks about Christ, he is saying Christ is synonymous with our imagination. That's right. And he says that here, Paul is telling us that he is that man and that he traveled by the power of imagination or Christ in his next letter to the Corinthians. He writes, test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? We need not be dead in order to enjoy spiritual privileges. Man is all imagination, and God is man. Test yourselves as this mother did. Sir Arthur Eddington said that all we have a right to say of the external world is that it is a shared experience. Things are more or less real according to the extent to which they are capable of being shared with others or with ourselves at another time. But there is no hard and fast line. Accepting Eddington's definition of reality as shared experience, the above story is as real as the earth or a color for it was shared by both mother and daughter. The range of imagining is such that I must confess that I do not know what limits, if any, there are to its ability to create reality. All these stories show us one thing, that an imaginal activity implying the wish fulfilled must start in the imagination apart from the evidence of the senses in that journey that leads to the realization of the desire. Mm -hmm. Very good. Jeffrey raised an interesting point, uh, which I'll treat like a question, although I don't think he was actually asking it as a question, but I'll treat it that way, that way anyway. He says, I wonder if it helps if the seer is thinking of the other person or in an allowing state. What do you think of that? Well, when we look at this particular story, it, it, it almost seems like it would be impossible for her not to be thinking of the other person. I mean, if there, if the other person, the other person's the reason why I think she's even attempting this, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they didn't really specify. The story doesn't actually say why. You know, the the storyteller sitting in or standing next to her mantle in her San Francisco living room was suddenly thinking about her daughter in London. It doesn't give a why. It just says, I did this. That's it. Right. And I, and I think that at least she would be thinking of her daughter in the sense that it was her daughter's home. There's that connection. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I think that, I think it's a good point to think about because of the connectivity between us all. And right. it raises an important People. question. What, what is an allowing state? I mean, in this context, an allowing state is literally a state of allowing yourself to believe that you're not in San Francisco. Well, I think the cool thing is that I, she even used herself the word experiment. Mm -hmm. 
like my little experiment. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and so to me, when we do an experiment, um, we have an, a sense of openness about the outcome. Usually there's a curiosity there. And in the truest sense of doing an experiment, we're, you know, we're not going to make an assumption about the outcome. So there's a lot of non-resistance happening, I think, looking at her experience. I agree with you. Yeah, in fact, the the uh, use of the word experiment in that uh, second paragraph of the story kind of illustrates, while she didn't state up front why she was focusing on her daughter's living room in, in London, she kind of states after the fact that it was an experiment. Like, this is something to just try, just to see what would happen. You know, what, 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 not, not even whether something would happen, but what would she experience as she was doing it? I think that's probably what was going through her mind. Like, if I try to imagine myself in my daughter's living room in London, what, what is that imagination like? I, I, I suspect that was the extent of the experiment, and it kind of went further than she had in mind. Well, I think also that we've talked about this before, about deciding that we're going to do this kind of exercise for the sole purpose of enjoying the exercise. Mm-hmm. Sure. Right? Like, I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to remember eating the best chocolate cake I've ever eaten. <laughs> and it tasted so amazing. And I'm thinking about it, and I'm just enjoying it. My mouth's watering because I'm remembering how delicious it was. And there's a difference between doing that because I think I'm going to manifest some chocolate cake floating into the house. Mm-hmm. Or I'm just doing it because it's such a good memory and it tasted so good. Yep. And mm-hmm. that's the part, you know, that goes back to that whole, you can, you know, you can't make it happen. You can let it happen. But if right. you try to let it happen to make it happen, it won't happen. So it's, <laughs> it's a conundrum, right? It's like we have to get to that place where we can enjoy the imaginal space for the sake of enjoying the imaginal space. That's when things start to happen. Why? Because we're not attached to the outcome at that point. Mm-hmm. Well, we're not only not attached to the outcome, we're not attached to the event happening in a particular way because we don't feel like we have to intervene and pre-plan and, and make it happen. There's Just no an experiment. Yeah. Just an experiment. And I, I love that she used that word. I think it's fantastic. It's so very descriptive. See, we, um, we can go on to the next chapter. Yeah. The yeah, next, and it's not a long chapter anyway, so I think it'll work out very nicely in terms of the timing. The next chapter's title is Enter Into. Uh, and, of course, immediately I, I think of entering into an imaginal state. But let's mm. see what Neville says. He, he starts off with a quote from Blake. He says, if the spectator would enter into these images in his imagination, approaching them on the fiery chariot of, chariot of his contemplative thought, if he could... Make a friend and companion of one of these images of wonder, which always entreats him to leave mortal things, as he must know. Then would he arise from his grave. Then would he meet the Lord in the air, and then he would be happy. So Neville says, imagination, it seems, will do nothing that we wish until we enter into the... <laughs> do you hear those sirens going Yes, on? oh yes, very... <laughs> uh, Imagination, it seems, will do nothing that we wish until we enter into the image of the wish fulfilled. Now, this is really interesting because we've heard over and over, and we've we've quoted Neville over and over saying, assume the feeling Mm -hmm. of the wish fulfilled. Right. Assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled. But right now he's saying, enter into the image of the wish fulfilled. Yeah. Kind of a different take. Uh, Same same concept, by the way. Same concept. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because at the beginning of the show today, you were talking about uh, imagining your your skeletal system, but imagine your container, you know, imagine this glow like a light bulb. Right. Mm -hmm. And that it was a visual thing that you could do, but that you could feel it. Yes. So I see he's talking about enter into the image right parallel with his assume the feeling. Yeah, I think the key word there is enter. Yeah. uh, Because we can certainly imagine kind of along the lines of his uh, ladder analogy. We can imagine yes. you know, the picture of ourselves climbing the ladder or we can imagine actually climbing the ladder. Right. Same thing here. We can kind of imagine this image as being like away from us, separate from us, or we can imagine ourselves in the image, and that's a different experience. Exactly. 
All right. He says, does not this entering into the image of the wish fulfilled resemble Blake's void outside of existence, which if entered into englobes itself and becomes a womb? Is this not the true interpretation of the mythical story of Adam and Eve? I love Man that and globes. <laughs> and globes. Add that to the dictionary. Right. If I try to type that, word's going to ask me if I want to correct it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Man and his emanation are not man's dreams of fancy, his emanation, his Eve in whom he plants himself in all her nerves, just as a husbandman, his mold, and she becomes his dwelling place and garden fruitful 70 fold. He's quoting William Blake from the mental traveler. If you hear this, I love this line, are not man's dreams of fancy, his emanation, Mm. right? Like, our, we, we just read a story about a woman who imagined herself somewhere and was seen in that place. Yeah. And not only was she seen there, but she saw the person who was seeing yes. her. <laughs> that was the best part. And I think an emanation, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it's a perfect word for this. Neville says the secret of creation is the secret of imagining. Mm-hmm. First, desiring. And then assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled until the dream of fancy, the void outside existence is entered and englobes itself and becomes a womb, a dwelling place and garden fruitful 70 fold. Note well that Blake urges us to enter into these images. This entering into the image makes it englobe itself and become a womb. I think of those snow globes. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, like (laughs) a little world. They're like a little world of their own, right? Right. And when things shake up in there, they stay in there. And so it's it's like a womb. It's like its mm-hmm. own little place. He says man, by entering a state, impregnates it and causes it to create what the union implies. Blake tells us that these images are shadowy to those who dwell not in them, mere possibilities. But to those who enter into them, they seem the only substances. All right, so I'm not sure who's writing here, um, because it I don't see a signature. So let me scroll down because it seems like we're going to go right into a story here. And I was like, is Neville telling the story? Well, I'm seeing a story in my copy, so I think it yeah. probably is. On my way to the West Coast, I stopped in Chicago to spend the day with friends. My host was recovering from a severe illness, and his doctor advised him to move to a one-story house. Acting upon the doctor's advice, he had purchased a one-story house suited to his needs. But he now was confronted with the fact that there seemed to be no buyer for his large three-story home. When I arrived, he was very discouraged. In trying to explain the law of constructive imagining to my host and his wife, I told them the story of a very prominent New York woman who had come to see me concerning the rental of her apartment. She maintained a lovely city apartment and a country home, but it was absolutely essential that she rent her apartment if she and her family were to spend the summer at their country home. In previous years, the apartment had been rented without any difficulty early in the spring. But at the time she came to see me, the season for summer sublets was seemingly over. Although the apartment had been in the hands of a good real estate agent, No one had seemed interested in renting it. I told her what to do in her imagination. She did it, and in less than 24 hours, her apartment was rented. I explained how she, by the constructive use of her imagination, had rented her apartment. At my suggestion, before she went to sleep that night in her apartment in the city, she imagined she was lying in her bed in her country home. In her imagination, she viewed the world from the country house rather than from the city apartment. She smelled the fresh country air. She made this so real that she actually drifted off to sleep feeling that she was in the country. That was on a Thursday night. At 9 o'clock the following Saturday morning, she phoned me from her country home and told me that on Friday, a highly desirable tenant who met all of her requirements not only rented her apartment, but rented it on the condition that he could move in that day. (laughs) (laughs) Not too shabby. I suggested to my friends that they build an imaginal structure as this woman had done. 
and that was to sleep, imagining they were physically present in their new home, feeling that they had sold their old home. I explained to them the wide difference between thinking of the image of their new house and thinking from the image of their new house. Thinking of it is a confession they are not in it. Thinking from it is proof they are in it. Entering into the image would give substance to the image. Their physical occupancy of the new house would follow automatically. I explained that what the world looks like depends entirely on where man is when he makes his observation. And man, being all imagination, must be where he is in imagination. This concept of causation disturbed them, for it smacked of magic or superstition, but they promised they would try it. I left that night for California, and the following evening, the conductor on the train in which I was traveling handed me a telegram. It read, House sold midnight last. (laughs) One week later, they wrote and told me that the very night I left Chicago, they fell asleep physically in the old house, but mentally in the new, viewing the world from the new home, imagining how things would sound if this were true. They were awakened that very night from their sleep to be told the house was sold. Not until the image is entered, until Eve is known does the event burst upon the world. The wish fulfilled must be conceived in the imagination of man before the event can evolve out of what Blake calls the void. (laughs) I like that. That's pretty amazing, right? I I especially like the fact that it's a story within a story. Yes, I do too. (laughs) You know what I mean? Because he's telling the story about how there was a story he told and that the story that he told was going to influence the people in the story that he's telling. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and once again, and we've seen this several times, we've heard a lot of these stories where the person, um, you know, was a follower of Neville and attended his lectures and was completely convinced that all of this would work. But we've also heard stories where people are like, I didn't think this would work at all. Right. And right. Here's this person. They thought it was superstition. They thought it sounded like mad magic. Mm-hmm. He said it disturbed them greatly. Yep. But they said they would try it. So. That's amazing. So I don't know that, you know, that faith and belief in the in the method is always as important as we sometimes make it out to be. Well, you know what I think happens? <laughs> I think I, I do believe that that faith and belief do play an important role in it. I think what happens is while we are working on building that belief up, we are also doubting. And so it's like we're resisting ourselves as we're doing it. Whereas it's quite possible for someone to just kind of fling themselves into it and say, okay, well, just give this crazy thing a shot. They don't have any resistance built up, so it doesn't take a whole lot of belief, and bang, they're there. Uh, exactly, like the experiment. Like, yes. what's it, like what's it going to hurt? Yeah. You know? Okay, I'll try it. Yeah. Yep. And True. then when it happens, it's mind-boggling. <laughs> <laughs> and then there has been a story, too, where someone was actually going to they, – they undertook this as an experiment, but as, as their, their intention was to prove it wrong. Mm -hmm. i'm gonna prove that this doesn't work i've done that one i've done that in a a variety of different ways yeah and been dismayed by the result (laughs) amazing yeah so neville goes on to say this next story proves that by shifting the focus of her imagining mrs mf entered physically into where she had persisted in being imaginatively entered physically he says Mm -hmm. so here's the story Soon after our marriage, my husband and I decided that our greatest joint desire was a year in Europe. This objective may seem reasonable to a lot of people, but to us, tied to a narrow sphere of limited finances, it seemed not only unreasonable, but completely ridiculous. Europe might as well have been another planet, (laughs) but I had heard your teaching, so I persisted in falling asleep in England. (laughs) I'm really liking how she's thinking. (laughs) Yeah. Why England necessarily? I cannot tell, except that I'd seen a current motion picture featuring the area around Buckingham Palace and had promptly fallen in love with the scene. All I did in my imagination was to stand quietly outside the great iron gates and feel the cold metal bars grip tightly in my hands as I viewed the palace. Make a note here. You were talking earlier about Instead of seeing yourself climb up a ladder, you're actually 
feeling your hands gripping the sides of the ladder. This is what she did, right? Exactly. She feel the metal bars of the great iron gates in her hands. For many, many nights, I felt an intense joy at being there and fell asleep in this happy state. Soon after, my husband met a stranger at a party who, within one month, was instrumental in securing a teaching fellowship for him at a great university. Imagine my excitement when I heard the university was in England. (laughs) Tied to a narrow sphere, within another month, we were crossing the Atlantic, and our supposedly insurmountable difficulties melted as though they never existed. We had our year in Europe, one of the happiest years of my life. Great story. I love that story. <laughs> yeah, we need to be reminded it. of these. That's, I think that's why I like stories so much, particularly the Neville stories, but really any stories. We need them. They're, they're like nourishment to just give us the energy to say, you know what? I know that I didn't always maintain my level of, con- of conviction, and I didn't really stick to the nightly pattern of, of imagining myself feeling the wish fulfilled and all that you know, I, I know I didn't do it right, but I just get tired sometimes. I get so tired, and I, it doesn't feel like it's going to work. You know, when you hear a story, it just kind of washes that away and reminds yeah. you, yeah, this really does work. It does, you know, it's kind of a nourishment. It's a, it's a refueling to it hear a definitely, story. Definitely. It's, it's inspiring. Yeah. yeah. Um, what the world looks like depends entirely on where man is when he makes his observations. And man, being all imagination must be where he is in imagination. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That stone is imagining. I acquaint you with this secret and leave you to act or react. He quotes George Hebert, the Alexer. This is the famous stone that turneth all to gold. For that which God doth touch and own cannot for less be told. So here we go into another story. <laughs> My home is old, but it is mine. I wanted the exterior painted and the interior redecorated. Yet I had no money to accomplish either objective. You told us to live as though our desire is already a reality. And this I began to do, imagining my old house with a brand new coat of paint, new furnishings, new decoration, and all the trimmings. I walked in my imagination through the newly decorated rooms. I walked around the outside, admiring the fresh paint. And at the end of my imaginal act, I handed the contractor a check for payment in full. (laughs) I entered this imaginal scene faithfully as often as I could during the day and each night before I fell asleep. Within two weeks, I received a registered letter from Lloyd's of London, telling me I had inherited $7,000 from a woman I had never met. I had known her brother slightly almost 40 years before and had performed a small service 15 years ago for the lady when this brother had died in our country, and she had written to me asking for particulars regarding his death to which I was able to provide. I had not heard from her since that time. Now, here was the check for $7,000 more than enough to cover the cost of my house restoration, plus many, many other things I desired. <laughs> what a great story. It, it occurs to me, two things occur to me about this story. First, this was clearly before the days of DIY and Lowe's and Home Depot. I mean, he had to go to a contractor. That was his only way to do it. That or go to a local general store and buy the paint and try to, to handle all of it himself without having the, uh, the Home Depot guys to go to, to guide you on how to get the job done. So I can understand. I mean, that was a, it was a time where you either knew how to do this stuff yourself because your parents had taught, taught you or you didn't know and you were dependent right. on somebody else. And what would you say, what year was this? I am going to guess somewhere in the 1950s. I don't okay. Know. So I think this is really interesting. Um, it was $7,000, right? Oh, you're going to do a conversion? Yeah, seven thousand dollars. That's a lot of money today. That's probably you know what it would be today if you bought an item in 1955 for seven thousand dollars. I'm going to guess around twenty thousand. Sixty-seven thousand. Sixty-seven thousand. Oh. <laughs> so, so if we retell that story, like she, 
you know, two weeks later, she receives a check out of the blue for sixty-seven thousand dollars. That, that's a piece of change, yeah. That should get, that should get us inspired, right? <laughs> Go buy the Home Depot for that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Neville Neville says, "He who does not imagine in stronger and better liniments." and in stronger and better light than his perishing and mortal eye can see does not imagine at all. That's quoting from Blake. Unless the individual imagines himself, someone else, or somewhere else, the present conditions and circumstances of his life will continue in being and his problems recur. For all events renew themselves from his constant images. By him they were made, by him they continue in being, and by him they can cease to be. The secret of causation is in the assembled imagery. But a word of warning, the assemblage must have meaning. It must imply something or it will not form the create creative activity, the word. Uh, that's an interesting thought. Let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah, yeah, there's a few concepts there. But go ahead, you first. What well, would you just, have in mind? Just that the, that the assemblage must have meaning. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, sometimes... You know, there are many, many law of attraction failures. <laughs> and I'm not calling them the people failures. I mean right. the experiments failures, right? Yes. It's like I tried this, it didn't work. We hear this all the time. We hear sure. people say, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I tried this, it doesn't work. And I think about sometimes when people say they have a desire, but if you really dig in, you find out that that's not really a desire. Mm -hmm. It's the thing they think they should be desiring. Yes. Because someone else thinks they should desire it or because it's the cool thing to desire or someone else, you know, it's like thinking that you should be a famous artist because all your life people told you you were good at art and you don't really have a desire to be, you know, that kind of thing, right? It's like there's a lot of facets to what can be going on. And I think sometimes... People try to consciously create something that doesn't have a lot of meaning for them. I think there's a classic uh, example of that that almost everybody can identify with, and that's trying to attract money. Mm -hmm. Because money is not something that most of us have a strong feeling about. No, it's just well, it's just a means of buying things. That's all it is. If, If money, if money was just money and it couldn't be spent, nobody would be trying to attract it. Right. Right. It's like, and that's, it's the famous life coach question when someone says they want to attract money or they want a certain, I want to be a millionaire or I want to make a hundred thousand dollars this year. Those are real popular figures. Sure. A million dollars or they want to make six figures. And there's nothing wrong with having a million dollars or making six figures. Uh, But why do you want that? Mm -hmm. What will having that give you? And, you know, for some people, it may give them the ability to travel or the sense of security. Other people, it may just be that they want to feel powerful, Mm -hmm. that in our world, money affords some kind of power. Mm -hmm. Uh, So knowing what you want it for, I think that is the key to digging into that place where suddenly it has meaning for you. Knowing it and imagining it, too, because... I find that often happens. I'll, I'll be working on, okay, so what do I want to have this money for? And I'll come up with, well, I want to be able to pay off the bills, and I want to do some traveling, and I want to do all this. But I don't actually put myself into the trip to England, you know? Right. right. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I had such a clear experience of, of understanding this years ago um, when I was actually just beginning my – training as a coach so it's been this december will be or this november next month will be 10 years uh and i remember at the time i volunteered to be the client and Mm -hmm. it was a really a silly kind of to me a kind of silly exercise it was like okay we're going to talk about um personal development right who who wants to be the the client i said i will so the coach trainer asked me okay so Tell me something that you want to learn. And I said, I want to learn how to speak French. And it was a true statement, I thought, right? I had bought a a, learning, a language lesson course, but I found myself not really doing it, right? It's like I, I purchased it. I had this desire, but I wasn't doing it. And she said, 
I said, well, I purchased this course, you know, and it cost me money and everything, but I just find myself, uh, just uh, when I go to do it, I just don't, I just don't, haven't gotten it done. Mm -hmm. So she's asking me these questions and asking me another question. And then she said, well, tell me what, what would you be able to do if you could speak French? And I said, well, my son has been speaking French for seven years and he speaks it fluently. And I think it would really be fun to be able to, you know, speak to him when he's speaking French. And, you know, we dug a little bit more. And really the desire was a connection with my son, a deeper mm -hmm. connection with my son. Mm -hmm. Had nothing to do with speaking French. Yeah. And I still remember to this day, like, I felt like my face was just burning up, like, when she said that, you know, because I have two sons. We were very close, all of us. But I recognized that, that was a time in his life when he was spending more time away. I mean, he was growing up, right? So he was, and that's what it really was, is that I had this deep desire to maintain the connection I have with my son. And he was in a direction where he spoke French probably more than he spoke English. And that's what it really was. See, suddenly that had a lot of meaning to me. Yeah. Where learning to speak that language, it didn't really have any meaning. What happens, Not I like think, that. is... We, we we end up in a place where the moment we come up with something that's important to us, we in, immediately, immediately, within a split second, kick over to the means to getting there. Yes, yes. We don't spend any time in there. <laughs> it's all <laughs> right. on the means. How is it going to happen? <laughs> right, exactly. And so this is a really great key for, for the end of this chapter, and that is to – Dig around a little bit, you know, if you need, if you need to, you know, talk to a coach or talk to a friend, but get, get down in deeper than just, I want X, right? And figure exactly. out why you want it, figure out what it would give you, and then put yourself into that imagination, enter into that imaginal space where the thing has meaning for you. And in the last couple of minutes that we have, um, going back to the first story that we told about the woman who imagined herself in her her daughter's living room in London, England. I'm not sure if it was London, but in England. Uh, and the question that Jeffrey's raising is maybe they were sharing the same emotional state and therefore allowed for it to happen. That's an interesting question. Do they both have to be sharing the same emotional state? What do you think? I don't know if they have to, but I definitely know, like I said before, people are connected. Mm -hmm. And I mean, think about the times when you think of someone and then they call you or, you know, I know I'm so guilty of this still. I try to do better and I am doing better, but I'll have someone on my mind and I'll recognize all of a sudden, oh, I've had this person on my mind for like four or five days, but I've done nothing about it. Right. And so mm -hmm. I'll send them a message. And very often it's either they've had me on their mind, too, or something's going on that I can help with. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like. Yeah, so I think absolutely. Wouldn't that be interesting if the daughter had been thinking about the mother and wishing she could see her and then she appeared, you know? Possibly so. I totally would think that would be. I think it actually does make sense because, like we talked about before, we often hear stories of people who astrally projected themselves. They projected themselves yep. in another place. Right. We almost never hear the story about it was, what it was like for the person who was at the other end right. of, of the journey. <laughs> You know, but that's what we heard in this case. And I think we did hear it because it wasn't included in the story. But I'll be willing to bet that the daughter was in a space at that moment in time of what Abraham would call vibrating to wouldn't it be great to see her mother or I wonder what my mother is doing or you know something along the lines of what's going on with her mother. And the funniest that, part is they both her. freaked out. Yeah. <laughs> well, they weren't expecting it. It goes back to what we were just talking about. We're constantly caught up in means, and we don't allow ourselves to actually stay in the state very often of experiencing that which we really want. We're just, we have so many experiences where we've convinced ourselves, well, I, I don't always get what I want, so therefore I'm not going to stay there. I'm going to be just, just focused on means because it's safer, because I, I, that way I won't be disappointed. But you stay in that, that mindset long enough, when something actually does come through, you say, well, what was that? <laughs> Right? <laughs> I love it. That's funny. So, good stories today. I, I love, too, the fact that we're, we're getting more stories in this book. I, I can't remember any of the other books having, I'll say, like a, a density of stories like this one. No, it's just this one. Yeah. It's yeah. a good one. 
So <laughs> that, that makes it a, a very worthwhile book. Well, I'm glad you're back. I'm glad that we're doing uh, Devil Stories again. Yeah. And uh, we'll be picking up with Chapter 10 next week. Before we go, tell people how to reach Cindy Chavez, the life coach. They can reach me at my website, cindychavez.com, C I N. D-I-E-C-H-A-V-E-Z.com. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. I'm all in those places as well. And I would love for you to reach out and say hello. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Thank you, live streamers. Thank you to our podcast listeners as well. And we will see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.